Okay. For today, the message that I have here is not a complicated one. It is really a message, I think, that is intended to remind us, focus us, drill a point in, one point only. In that regard, your mind might try to check out on you because it's, you're going to hear the same point over and over again. But on the other hand, you're going to hear it from me a different way every point. Jesus, we ask that you would bless this message because we need what your word shows. And we ask, Jesus, that you would give us the strength to do that which your word shows. Thank you for your scriptures, which are so clear. Help us to walk into the footsteps of those that have gone before us who have written these very verses. In Jesus' name, amen. The title of our message this morning is In Hope. In Hope. The references that I have here you can find very easily yourself the same way I did. Punch up your computer, go to your concordance, look up the word hope, and start reading. So it's not a complicated sermon. You can write it yourself, change the order of the verses according to your spiritual necessity, and live off of it in any portion you need. However, having said that, I'm going to read the very first verse. 1 Corinthians 13.13 13 says, And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. We hear a lot about faith. We hear a lot about love. But we don't always realize that hope is the third leg of the stool. Now, if you sit on a stool that only has two legs, what happens to you? You rock. You thunk. You <coughs> rock and thunk. If I were to start a company called the Two-Legged Chair Company, how many people would invest in my company? Not too many. <coughs> a one-legged chair doesn't even work. A post into the ground without some kind of base won't do a thing. We call that a pogo stick. You can't even stand on a pogo stick. You've got to jump on it because it will tip you over as soon as you stand on it. The point here is, in, in visual imagery, if we're going to have a good, solid footing in our Christian walk, then we need to always make sure that every day includes a little of all three of these. In chemistry, if you mix two things together and forget the third element that makes the explosion, what you get is dead liquid. <laughs> Right? If you don't put the right elements together on something, you don't get the product that it produces. There are so many things hidden in God's creation that you cannot get the byproduct of until you add the catalyst. One or other of the catalysts. It just won't work. It's called inert in science. It's inert. It just sits there. It's blue, it's green, it's whatever it is, but it's inert meaning it has no energy to it. Then you add that third thing, a little bit of magnesium maybe, or a little bit of something else, and poof, up comes the smoke and fire, you know, there goes the hole in the desk. <laughs> Some other sort of thing happens in your chemistry lab, you know, hopefully you don't blow up a whole building because it happened to be nitro and glycerin with a catalyst, you know. Sometimes the third element is electricity. Block a C4, you know, got a charge sitting in it, just a chunk of plastic. You know, you could mold it into a little, little, uh, what you call it, figurine if you want. Turn it into a, a rabbit stand or a <coughs> flower pot. 
until you blast it with electricity and all of a sudden it goes boom. That's the power of mixing things. Well, if you stop and think about faith, hope, and love as that kind of power, then you realize why sometimes one of them by itself isn't working. Because faith doesn't exist without hope. Love will get you to do a lot of things not in faith. The mistake that's being made and the easy correction that's necessary is for us to realize that when it said the greatest of these is charity, it didn't mean the only thing is charity. It's a number one mistake. It's the same mistake that the non-Pentecostals make with the Pentecostals on the subject of speaking in tongues and prophesying. Better that you prophesy than speak in tongues and not interpret. So they say, see, better don't need tongues. Well, it's better if I put my car in third gear when I'm driving second gear ain't bad, but it's better if I use third to get up to 70 miles an hour. Right? But that doesn't make second gear unimportant. Some hills you can't crawl on third gear. You drop it to first gear to get up a steep hill. Right? The steeper the hill, the more torque you need. <coughs> it's equally true when we look at these things and say, is love the it but I show you a more excellent way. Love. Forget all them gifts things. Because I showed you a more excellent way, didn't I? I showed you a better way. I keep hearing this set of statements about, well, we don't need X because we have Y, and it's better. Well, then why did the Lord give us X and Y? Amen. He wasn't trying to negate anything. He was trying to increase something. So there's a time for faith, there's a time for love, but there's also a time to be in hope. To be within hope. Psalm 16.9 Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoices, my flesh also shall rest in hope. Acts 2.26 says, Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope. My heart is glad. Do you realize how much power there is in a glad heart? Just by itself. My heart is glad. People who believe in the New Age way of thinking, Pollyanna, very positive. I've watched some of them conquer mountains that I can't conquer. Because they just go up against it and no matter what, they keep their heart happy. There was a lady that I used to work with who's now retired, who every day of her life, she said every day of her life, everything she did for the company, she was scared to death. Every day of her life. She would come home and for an hour after returning home from work, her stomach would hurt because of the things she had to do for work. You want to know what her job was? Awards and distribution of congratulations and recognitions and setting up programs for people to be acknowledged for what they did. But she was so internally shy that to do it was misery every day of her life. But I never knew that until just before she retired because every time I saw her, her heart was glad. She was the happiest, bubbliest, most powerfully positive individual working in a job that was given to her because she was the happiest, most bubbliest, capable of making everybody else feel a good person. Mm -hmm. Yet she acknowledged to me that every day of her life <laughs> she hurt because her heart was able to override that which she felt otherwise because it was glad he says my flesh shall also rest in hope now I don't know if you caught the significance of that but our flesh gets all in turmoil our, our being gets all in turmoil right 
because of trials, tribulations, difficulties, economic distress, political unrest, you know, wackos and airplanes, and you know, we just get all out of it. And the net effect of that against us is our body, our very existence, starts going through trauma. Mm -hmm. It starts breaking down. It starts putting out chemicals to protect, and those chemicals are designed to shut you down. Did you know that? The more stress you have, the more pain you're in, the more difficulty you go through, the more frustration and anger you have, there are chemicals your body releases to protect you so you don't blow apart and die. That's why people who, you know, they've proven that people who have heart attacks a lot of times, it's right after they were angry. Because the anger pushes up the adrenaline, pushes all these things up, and triggers these chemicals, and, and just this one time, the body couldn't cope with it. Couldn't slough it off fast enough. So the body gets no rest, as it were, the person gets no rest, because of the circumstances. But if you're living from the inside in hope, hope begins to stabilize. It acts like a gyroscope. It says to you, you know, this is a pretty bad situation, but I serve a good God. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. I know the Word. If I just go back to it and look at it, I'm sure I'll find answers that hope then begins to put your flesh, yourself, back at rest. I actually like the fact that the word flesh was used here. And I'm banking off it because it's true. Our flesh mirrors everything. It, it reflects it. It puts it out. Some people are more transparent than others. Some nations are more transparent than others. The British, you know, when they laugh, they probably go, <laughs> and to that, to them, that's a deep laugh. I'm not saying all British, but you know, the old old uh, comments about British humor, you know. Whereas a Texan might really guffaw, you know. <laughs> Whoa, the body's going to treat that same response, that same issue to the response differently. Your body reflects what your inner man is doing. If faith is in God to move the hand of God and love is for my fellow man and myself, then hope is for me. Catch that? Hope is for me. Because my faith is in Him for action. My love is me in action for them. Should have love for myself, but most of the time it's for them. But my hope is for me. Now, I've been thinking about what causes ministers of the past to fail, fall, collapse. Why is it that an A.A. A. Allen type person can heal multitudes in faith and then have to go to the bottle for himself? You tell me. It wasn't his faith that was the problem. And it wasn't his love either that was the problem. There had to be something else that broke the hope mechanism. And the hope had to be, the pain of that being reflected in the body, he went for alcohol to change that. There are people right now I know of who are in a bad strait because their hope got broken and their body reflected it so they went back to something else that sustained them. Now, if you can understand that the combination of my heart rejoicing, my tongue being glad, putting hope in my inner man strengthens my flesh, then you begin to understand why it says things like the tongue, if it's got a, you know, like a horse with a bit in it, turn the rider. Then you start understanding why the tongue becomes such an issue and you understand why the double keep keep your heart becomes such an issue because the net effect of that is you, the human, begin to start having in your existence the benefit of that. And externally, God is able to work because you're operating in faith mixed with hope. I have a feeling that there are some people who uh, look at hope as, as a, um, a byproduct of circumstances. Okay? In other words, if things are going really good at work, I'm hoping for a raise. Because things are going really good at work, I'm hoping for improvement. 
you know, things aren't bad here. I'm, I'm, we're going to have kids, and I'm hoping for a better marriage. We're using hope as the tail of the dog. Some object, some something, something in this life to make me feel better is going to produce my hope. And then we seem to have, you know, a byproduct of a certain amount of faith for that. Right? The net effect is, though, when those things go away, our hope goes away. When our hope goes away, we can't pray in faith anymore. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for, and all of a sudden our faith is crippled. And when our faith is crippled, guess what? Our three-legged stool falls over because the love's not good enough to get us through. By itself, we collapse. Check anywhere and you'll find that I'm right. This is how the human condition works. They work together. Okay? Stir yourselves a little bit. <laughs> there you go. Romans 4.18 Speaking of uh, Abraham, it says this, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. Okay? God comes to a man and he says, I have a promise for you. I'm going to make your heritage, your lineage, the basis of many nations. <laughs> he went to Moses and said, these guys are a mess. I'll wipe them out and start all over with just you. You think Moses didn't know the Abrahamic situation and know that, yeah, God could do that? I'll just start all over with you. Did you know, did you realize that God did really did do that in the long run? There came a point where Messiah had to come. All of Israel failed, and he did for Christ what he said he was going to do to Moses. He said, I'm going to overturn the whole caboodle by one. Matter of fact, I'll take it all the way back to Adam and let's just start this thing over again. I'm going to create number two. And he's going to overturn everything number one did wrong, and everything my favorite nation did wrong, and everything that my favorite people did wrong, and I'll even use him as the basis for fixing all that. How about that? Abraham was a man who was called a friend of God. He had promises given to him that he chose to have faith in, didn't he? But what's interesting is he's accredited as the man of faith, yet he's called here one who, against hope, believed in hope. And that's such a funny phrase. Let me put it to you in my vernacular. I have no hope left. Okay, I'll have hope anyway. It's almost like saying, Lord, I believe. Uh, help my unbelief. I don't have hope, but I'm going to hope anyway. The power of the human will to say, contrary to all evidence, I'm going to do it anyway, we sometimes call that stubbornness, rebellion, <laughs> strong will. <laughs> but that's the dark side of a positive right. thing. Amen. I don't have any faith, I'll choose to have it. I don't have any hope right now, I'll choose to have it. I don't have any love in me right now, but I'll choose to have it. And as soon as that will is activated and the switch is locked, God says, thank you for opening the gates to this dam so I can get some water out of here. Amen. And I hate to tell you this, but the same thing is true about yielding to the Spirit and getting spiritual gifts operating and everything else. When you come to the place where you actually are willing to be spiritually used, you become spiritually used. You may not get a, a hundred and thousand one of them all at one time, but you do get them. And if you lose them, for some reason the gate closed. You say, well, God closed the gate. Sometimes. Sometimes he's closing a gate so you'll open another one. Okay? Sometimes... Sometimes he will um, change what he's going to do next. Because he's got to keep his adversary on the run. You've got to realize that. The devil comes in like a flood. God has to raise up a standard. Sometimes he'll reroute the river in order to get what he's after. But you have to realize 
that our role in it is to be Abrahamic. You've already been given a promise. God's done his part. The part you need to do, you need to do, you need to do, I need to do, is to take that promise and even though everything's against it happening, say, I'm going to open God anyway. Because that, what be, that is what becomes faith next. I think if we would quit undercutting the issue of hope and overemphasizing the issue of faith, our stool won't have one leg this long, one leg this short, one leg this short, and we're wondering how come we're tilted in our spiritual existence. They have to be equal. If you look at Jesus and what he offered, he offered it equal across the board. On and off over the years of my Christian walk, I've come to this verse and I've seen this issue of the three-legged stool. I keep forgetting that God's word is written very much like he encoded the universe. It's this, woven with that, woven with this, woven with that, produces this. If we do all that the Lord has written, we have success. It says, according to that which is spoken. I think it would be a good idea for everybody in this room, and anybody listening, to write down on a sheet of paper anything that God's ever spoken to them in hope, in promise. Because that is what we're supposed to be using as our beacon light, that's our lighthouse. That's what tells us what the course is that we're setting. And the rest of it's garbage. The rest of it's window dressing. Maybe not garbage, just window dressing. Abraham, it says, Abraham's bosom. Right? Even the dead get to go to a place named after this guy for hoping against hope. I mean, just, just think about what God views this guy as. When we get to heaven and we go walking around, you know, I'm being a little facetious here, but we go walking around and we get to finally meet Abraham, assuming we do, because, I mean, there's going to be billions of people up there. We're going to walk by Abraham, and I don't know what his, as it were, I'm being a little facetious, his insignia is going to look like. But if he were a military man, it would be, you know, the blue stripe, the red stripe, the green stripe, the, you know. He's going to have just a few down here in his medals of honor and purple heart and green heart. and You know what I mean? For doing... And having, as it were, far less than some of us in the Pentecostal time period have. We're going to be ashamed because we had all the power given to us. And we had none of the hope. And he had all the hope and none of the power. And he gets to be father of nations and we get to be father of one. If we get our one, you know what, home. So what I'm trying to say here is what I felt last night when I said, Lord, okay, so what do I preach today? I have no idea what I'm preaching today. What is the main point of today? And the main point of today is the sermon title, In Hope. So I'm just going to keep hammering at it. Romans 5.2 By whom also we have access by faith into this grace where we, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So, we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and you would think that should be all we need, right? We got the faith, we got the grace and we, we can stand. And yet he says, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now, the glory of God, just for the moment, let's simplify it to just what Jesus did when he walked on earth. He showed the glory of God. Healings, miracles, deliverances, demonstration of God himself. That's glory. God getting his glory. Plain and simple. Our hope is in the glory of God. Now, you know how meager you feel in your natural existence. You know how you feel like, you know, a, a piece of wood in the middle of a, a wild wave river. Our hope is that God will come down and snatch that block of wood of us out of the river and put us where it needs to be in the temple it needs to be in. Use us for what it's for. So he gets his glory out of us. His glory through us brings us into the place in the temple, as it were, that is glory to him. But our faith, causing us to stand in grace, that's good, 
but our hope is to see the next. In a certain sense, I can understand why Paul said, leaving behind those things which are the basics and moving on to things which are beyond the basics. Because you already have your salvation. You're already filled with things. You should already be operating in faith. You should have these things. But there's always more of the glory of God that uh, needs to be manifest. And that requires us to have hope for that. Otherwise, we're living for today and stuck in yesterday. And we don't want to be living for today and stuck in yesterday. We want to be living for tomorrow and passing through today. Today should seem so fleeting to us because we're in such a dead race going forward into the promises that yesterday becomes a blur. I'll tell you what most of us are trying to do. Most of us are trying to look at yesterday to figure out and analyze what we did wrong, bear up under today's heavy burdens, and see if we can get through it, and then we'll worry about tomorrow when we get to it. How can you worry about tomorrow and get to it and have hope? You can't. The hope is the, the direction you're pointing your face. You can't have hope to the past. All you can have is either, you know, pat on the back or a kick in the, in the, in the uh, regret department. But hope always points you forward. Hope points you forward in the case of Abraham thousands of years. <laughs> Jesus endured the suffering because of the hope of what was in front of him. Yeah. He could put up with today's, you know, uh, a bad religion because of tomorrow's great hope. Imagine him walking around with absolute ability to do whatever he wants and he has to wait for a kingdom that isn't going to show up for 3,000 more years. <laughs> could you wait for a promise God gave you to be fulfilled in about 3,000 years? I'd say most of us give up if it isn't fulfilled in the next three hours. Why is that? Because our faith failed? No, I think it's because our hope failed. We undercut our hope. So we need to hope for the glory of God. We need to hope for these things. We need to trust for these things. We need to look forward to these things. Romans 8.20 For the creature was made subject to vanity... You're the creature. This world is the vanity. <laughs> Not willingly. Amen. I didn't ask for this. <laughs> but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. In other words, what he did was he said, you know what? I'm going to show you something. I made a good world, but it's not a great world. Even if Lucifer hadn't intervened, even if you'd lived out your life down here without demonic influence, you would have still been a human being working out things. And this life, as good as it would have been even from the garden on, was never the hope. The hope was always for the glory of God to be shown in things to come. Now, we don't know what promises were given to Adam in the early days. All we see is a story. He's created, and he fails, and he's out, and the promises he's given are the ones we know about. But when they were going for their walks in the garden, what did they talk about? What was God's desire for this creation prior to the fall? And where would it go from there? I would dare say this creation was never the issue. Because he says he subjected it they put it in here in hope of something. Now, how long does it take for you to realize that this life cannot give you everything you need? Can, can you get enough money? Can a human being get enough money? History shows the more money they get, the more money they want. Mm -hmm. Power. Can you get enough power in this life? Does, do human beings at a certain point go, Yep, I'm powerful enough. That's good enough for me. No. No, they got to buy up one more thing, merger one more thing, conquer one more thing, change one more thing. They just keep going. How many people are just looking for a little niche? All I really want is a, is a little house on the side of the hill, a little cottage. That's all I really want. I just, I just want that. That's my hope. Then they get it, and what do they do? Okay, now what do I hope for? 
the hope mechanism says, <coughs> uh, this isn't it, boys. So what else do you? Well, I, I, I just, I'm nervous. I don't know. I just feel like there should be more in my life. Uh, uh, maybe I should take up painting. That's what I'll take up. I'll hope to become a great painter. Mm -hmm. And then after a while, it's, well, maybe I'll hope to be a great pianist. Maybe I'll hope to be a great skier. Maybe I'll hope to be a great mountain climber. Because the mechanism inside is still going beep, 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 beep. This life is temporal, and all hope in it is temporal. Once you accept that and realize the pilot light's not going to go out, even your most depressed state of unhope, somewhere down in your belly, says, It's got to get better! <laughs> Something's got to change! Something's got to get better! And that is your hope mechanism that God's planted in there going it's, as it were, the GPS tracking system. God's personal spiritual tracking system. Looking for his own. Saying, can you believe me for this? Can you believe me for that? Can you believe me for this? Can you hear me now? <laughs> that hope, if you can realize how important it is, when it seems to grow dim, you end up hungry, feeling uneasy, uncertain. That's because it's not getting what it's supposed to. Mm. When your faith starts breaking down, your mind starts saying, "There's got to be God's got to be out there somewhere." Your mind starts saying, I've got "The faith, it's it's got to be fixed." And even love, when it breaks, even love, when it breaks, starts turning upon itself. Doesn't anybody love me? Doesn't anybody love me? Well, do you love yourself? No. Doesn't anybody love me? Because all three of those beacons are always on. They're planted. Subjected in hope. You were created this way to look at this creation to cry out for way more than you ever thought possible. Okay? Romans 12.12 12. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Here's what we Christians want. Not continuing instant in prayer, hoping there won't be any tribulations. Amen. And I'm really sad. <laughs> we can rejoice in our hope. Now that's really funny. It's funny because you would think hope and rejoicing don't go together. You see, to me, if I'm hoping for something, let's say I'm hoping for a million dollars. When I get the million dollars, then I'll do the rejoicing. Yay, I got the million dollars. But how do I rejoice in my hope? How can I go, hey, you know, I know God gave me promises. That's where your rejoicing starts kicking in. Because mm -hmm. all of a sudden your hope has got rejoicing backing it up. If he gave me promises, he'll fulfill his promises. That should make me happy. Mm -hmm. That should make me excited. I should every day be able to read my list of promises that God gave me and get excited. You should be able to every day find your scriptures that you need that make you happy. The joy of the Lord is your strength. But hoping in God is the basis behind it. So your rejoicing overturns your depression, doesn't it? You rejoice. Your heart is glad. I mean, how many times has he tied it? My heart is glad. My heart rejoices. I, I hope. Hope and happiness go together. Not acquisition and happiness. We look, as Americans, that acquisition makes happiness. Right. I don't care what the acquisition is. I don't care whether it's, yay, I'm finally used of God. Bless God, I got the power. Or, yay, I finally got the new Ferrari. I got the power. Or whether it's, I got the new power tool. I got the power. <laughs> acquisition doesn't produce that. It's a temporary fix to a spiritual problem. The real fix to the spiritual problem is believing in God for everything he has said that he will complete because he's author and finisher to our faith. So we rejoice in hope. Now, if you're rejoicing in hope, won't you be patient in tribulation? It'll increase your patience. And won't you be continuing instant in prayer? I'll tell you what it'll do for you. Hope says, God said. God said, if I ask, I get 
I didn't get yet, he said I should ask because he said I get to have it. So if I'm in hope, every day I'm going to ask until the day I get it. Now, you know you were kids once, and you know Christmas was a big time of the year, and you know that you'd go up to your dad or your mom, and you'd tell them what it is you wanted, and you'd write out your list for Sandy Claus, you know, in hope that the present would show up. And you'd wait for it, and on Christmas night, you'd go snooping around the boxes. Is it big enough to be the thing I asked for? All oh, these boxes are too small. It ain't the one I asked for. That's what little kids know that adults forget. When God says, I got gifts for you, I got presents for you, I got things I want to give you, our response should be exactly like that kid, right at the edge of the seat, in hope. But see, the trouble is as we get older, some of our littler hopes as kids got dashed. Some of the things we wanted didn't happen. Some of the things we thought were so important, somebody else thought wasn't important. And so our little hoping mechanism kind of went, oh, well, I guess I just got to hurt. Oh, well, I guess I just got to, you know, if I don't get it soon, I guess I just got to forget it, bury it, sink it. And all the while, our hope mechanism is getting squished, 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 squished. Then God comes along and says, here, I have these great promises for you. Right. Yeah. Then the salesman comes along and says, I have a deal for you. <laughs> right. Yeah, I buy that one too. Uh -huh. Then your heart starts to get excited. Something actually comes to get you excited. And you're getting fired up. And, and then the little voice goes, right. <laughs> the little anti-hope voice, you know. What we have to come to realize is that our rejoicing is in our hope. And our hope is in God. And our faith is in believing He'll give it to us. And his promises are sure and yea and amen. And he set us into this creation that falls apart to tell us that's the way it is. Just look around you. Next. <laughs> Romans fifteen thirteen. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Ooh. I didn't know the power of the Holy Ghost was for the purpose of producing hope. Of course it is. He healed you yesterday, he heals you tomorrow. Doesn't power produce hope? It should, unless you're broken. Unless you need a fixing up of a broken hope mechanism that's still going beep, 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 but it's got static around, you know? Beep, beep. <laughs> it says the God of hope. What does that tell you? That tells you you don't even have to generate it all by yourself. You can go to God and He can give you hope so that you can rejoice in your hope. He wants to fill you with joy and peace in believing. In believing. We want to sometimes not believe and then ask Him for joy and peace. That won't work. He gives it to us as we choose to believe in Him. Not really hard when you've got the God of hope filling you. But to think that the power of the Holy Ghost is actually one of the vehicles of our hope is amazing. 1 Corinthians 9.10 Or saith he it altogether for our sakes. For our sakes, no doubt, this is written. That he that ploweth should plow in hope and he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. Everything in this life has a certain amount of sowing and reaping in it. Everything in this life has a certain amount of plant and weight. When you plant something, it doesn't pop up tomorrow morning. You hope it will pop up during the season it's supposed to pop up in. Some people won't plant because they don't know that by doing it now you get it later. They figure, I'll wait. I'll procrastinate. I won't plant right now. I'm not going to plant my prayers today. I'm going to wait a little bit. I'm not going to do my scriptures today. I'm going to wait a little bit. And the net effect is that we don't plant and then when the season comes, when everybody else seems to be reaping a harvest, we're sitting there without 
grain. The good news is, in God's kingdom, planting is 24-7. And reaping is supposed to be 24-7. And there are promises that say the plowshare is going to overtake the sower and the sower is going to overtake the plowshare. Mm -hmm. That's a promise. God's plan has always been for perpetual prosperity on all levels. Now that tells me that we just have to do the meager little thing we have to do. Plant in hope. So maybe it's, you know, as we've talked about in times past, maybe it's write a book. Maybe it's just start to write a chapter. Maybe it's just start to write a paragraph in hope that someday the book will be done. Maybe it's just writing that song. You write the first few notes of that song. You write the chorus of that song. You don't know if it's going to be a Christian bestseller. It's a paragraph with a bunch of black spots with hooks on them. Call the song. Piece of a song. Do you know how many people, after they die, the famous ones, like the C.S. Lewis I'm thinking of, he dies, ha having written a whole bunch of stuff, right? And his brother starts burning all the leftovers. Fortunately, a fellow happened to show up, saw what was happening, and said, I want to create a... a um, what do you call it? A non-profit? That will preserve all that. Scraps upon scraps upon scraps of storylines and poem pieces and ideas and stuff that generated out of this man. And all we saw was the tip of the iceberg. The rest of it was headed for the burning. Um, another example I know of is uh, Gene Roddenberry, who, who was the creator idea behind Star Trek. Had other storylines, other plot lines, that his wife has taken over and turned into TV shows that are successful. He's dead and gone. and Some old set of scrap notes that he had that timelined something that he thought would might be a cool idea. Seed. That's what it is. Seed. Sitting in a bag waiting for somebody to plant it. Some plantings produce tenfold. Some plantings produce a hundredfold. But you see, the point here is in this that he that threshes should thresh in hope. He that plants should plant in hope. You should never be thinking that you've got to plant into a void. I do all this, but I don't know that it's going to do any good. That's not hope. Because that says to God, I don't think you're listening, watching, or care. And the fact is, he's not only listening, watching, and caring, he's trying desperately to get in there to help. That's a fact. So we have to get to the place of realizing our hope mechanism needs to be adjusted. Titus 1-2 In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. In hope of eternal life. I thought I already had eternal life. You do have eternal life. But you're also in hope of eternal life. I.e., I don't want to live down here forever. Okay? I may have life living within me that's eternal. But what I really want is life eternal living within me. <laughs> or me and it. <laughs> Let me say it that way. I want to be in hope of a place that is so far beyond this that I can't even conceive of it. That would be a pretty great hope, wouldn't it? And that's exactly what God said he did. I've set it up. you got mansions. You're going to go someplace in hope. Hang on. Hang on. Why do we have the ability to have that hope? Because God cannot lie. That's why. Now, you've got to understand how important that attribute is. I've got to get you to hear this one. God cannot lie. Your hope mechanism was broken because you either thought somebody promised something and lied or thought somebody promised something and didn't keep their word. Okay? That's what breaks the hope mechanism. That's what happens between human beings who are temporal, fragile, frail, etc. Okay? But the truth of the matter is, our hope can be mended because we know that God cannot lie. He cannot. This is so hard for people to get. Atheists want to try to make him into a liar. The discouraged want to say God doesn't keep his word. The devil tries to say half God said. But none of that's true because it, God cannot lie. 
God cannot lie. There are things God cannot do. God cannot die. God cannot cease. It's impossible. And he cannot lie. Now, if he cannot lie, then every promise he's ever made is yea and amen. So, well, but I still don't always see all the promises come to pass. What happens? What happens is there's a change on the temporal plane. And he's still trying to put his hands through. And because he cannot and will not just break everything that he made, because he could, he says, I need agreement. I need agreement. I need agreement. Give me agreement. I need you to hang on. I need you to hang on. Hang on. Don't quit. Don't give up. Don't listen to the watchers along the sideline who are talking to you. Don't listen to the voices in your head that are telling you, I lied. Pray 21 days. Pray 21 years. Doesn't matter. Don't let go. Abraham, some things he didn't get till he died. Some things he won't get until the plan's finished after he died. God doesn't lie. Do you know why Israel's going to get to rule the world? Because God cannot lie. He can't. He promised that Israel would rule. They are going to be the world government. The devil says, no, they're not. I'm going to raise up my own world government. Mm -hmm. I'm going to prove that God's a liar because I'm running this show because I'm the God of this world. I'm going to raise up my own world government. And God in the end is going to go, goodbye world government, so-called. That is not the world government. This is the world government. See my son? See my kingdom? See my priest? See my this? See my nation? That's the real world government. Righteous rulership. A righteous reign. God cannot lie. Promised before the world began. Why is it so important? Why does he say over and over again things like, speaking of Christ, you know, the glory which I had before the world began. You look in the book of Revelation, this was before the world began. This was before that began. Do you know why those verses exist? To tell you God's foreknowledge is so perfect and his ability is so infinite that he can say long before anything exists, here's my promise. Now, try and tell me I lie. Here's some additional verses to continue. Those were all verses that I looked up that had the phrase, in hope. Titus 2.13 Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. That one is incredible. Looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. I would say we need to look for that glorious appearing every day in anticipation of the glorious appearing that's going to come later. We've got opportunity to believe God for a great number of things. But the most important hope we have is Him. When you get to heaven, that song says, do you know what you're going to do? Are you going to cry? Are you going to laugh? What are you hoping for? What is it? What is it if, if you could say it, is, do you want to kneel at Jesus' feet instantly? Is that the first thing you want to do? Or is the first thing you want to do run around heaven and go, it's heaven, it's heaven? You know? Do you, do you want to see Uncle Joe, Auntie May, little Bobby Soso? What is your thing that you're looking forward to? He says right here, looking forward to the glorious appearing of the great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Like, wow. I want to sit in I want to be sitting in a room, a little tongue in cheek, but I want to be sitting in a room and 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 the 
time comes, the trumpet blows, and all of a sudden the room just turns white. And there he is. And his hand reaches out and he says, let's go. How about that for an image? How about an image of, of all of a sudden I happen to look up and the ceiling is gone. It's just gone, man. <laughs> it's big blue. And they're up there coming down like on an elevator of light. Here he comes. Stops. And all he does is he does this. You. This way. It's what my boss does to me at work when he wants to talk to me, for good or bad. You. Like this. Points his finger and wiggles it back, you know. Wouldn't it be nice just to have the glorious appearing and all this effulgent shows up and he just goes, everything in you would go, yes, sir, boss. You know, you're out of here. It's a hope. It's a hope. It's your hope to finally have a better place. When he appears, will he strengthen you? Well, if you're going to believe him for these things now, then you'll believe him for that thing then. Your hope. 1 Corinthians 13.7 says, Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Do you know what the context is? Love. Love hopes all things. Well, that's interesting. That makes my three-legged stool, again, balance itself. This is predicated on this, which is predicated on this, which is predicated on this. Now, I have a picture to add to your three-legged stool picture. Okay? You've been sitting on this three-legged stool. It has three, three legs that comes out, right? What he just did by saying it that way is he put posts between the legs. And that is pure stability yeah. in the imagery I'm using. <clears throat> because it is true. Your love will hope. Your hope will increase faith. Your faith will increase love. Your love will increase faith. Your faith will increase hope. Your hope will increase love. They are related. They're not standing alone. They're not independent. This next section I entitled, Sing It, Brother. <laughs> because they're all psalms. Every one of these scriptures is psalms. And I said, Sing It, Brother, because they're all songs. This is what people who are spiritual sing. As compared to people who are not. Psalm 31:24, Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all ye that hope in the Lord. Sounds like a music minister standing up there pointing at the crowd, doesn't it? Hope in the Lord, all ye people. Okay, so it's not in tune. But, it's the point of cross. Sing it. Your hope shouldn't just be, oh, I hope. Oh, I hope. I hope it comes to pass. See, we've gotten so warped on what hope is. Oh, I don't know if it's going to happen or not, but I sure hope so. That's not hope. That's mumbly peg. That's murmuring and doubting. Hope is, God is great and God is good. I'm going to believe. Got a little bit of a to it. A little bit of a kick. A little bit of a spunk. Should be sung. Be of good courage. He'll strengthen your heart. Hope in the Lord. Everybody after me sing. Hope in the Lord. Okay. Psalm 33, 18. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him. Yeah, that's right. Them that fear him. Them that are obeying the law. Them that are just, you know, digging in deep. Upon them that hope in his mercy. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> gotcha. You see, hope isn't banked on obedience. Hear me. Hope is not banked on obedience. Obedience is a different issue. Fear of the Lord deals with the issue of hope. Hey, excuse me. Deals with the issue of obedience. Yeah, see, even I switched it. Fear of the Lord says, Oh, I disobeyed. I better repent. I better repent because, quite frankly, He's big enough to fry me forever. But my hope isn't that He'll come down and see how obedient I was. My hope isn't in, 
When he appears in front of me, bless God, I didn't do this, and I didn't do that, and I didn't do this, and I didn't do that. And that's how Christians act, though, isn't it? Christians look at other Christians and say, well, at least when I stand before God, bless God, I didn't do this, and I didn't do that, and I didn't do this, and, and you know, I'm not like this man. No, 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 no. That's not what hope is. The hope is in the mercy of God. Lord, I messed up. <laughs> Save me? <laughs> Thanks. When I get to meet you face to face, you ain't going to hold a thing against me because I'm in grace. That's my hope. Right? That's hope. If you're living for law, you don't have hope because the law says by it no man can be justified. So where's your hope then if you're living by law? Law is like guardrails on a freeway that says, okay, here is the road you're supposed to be traveling. This is called spirit. And these posts over here are called, if you go this way, you're going to crash off a cliff. Now, if you go crashing off a cliff, God does have a tow truck. He has some pretty good guys who know how to haul people out of ditches, including some donkeys. And he can get them out, put them back on the freeway. You know what I'm saying? All that the sin posts, the law posts, tell you is, this way be dragons. This way be dragons. Your hope is none of that. Your hope is in the target that's up here that you're traveling towards. And that target is mercy. Because mercy rejoices over judgment. I guarantee you, when I look at the Lord and I say, someday I'm going to come home, if there's any fear in my heart, I should immediately overturn it with hope. I don't want to fear that I'm going to come home and meet Jesus and the first thing out of my mouth is going to be, you know, I'm so sorry. My first thing out of my mouth should be, thank you for saving my soul. That was my hope. My hope was never that when I got in front of you, I did everything 100% perfectly. I was a perfect Christian. I did it all exactly. And I didn't miss a step. Bless God, I did all the Ten Commandments and everything. What do I yet lack? Uh, how about hoping in me? How about following me? How about something other than self-righteousness? Our hope is in the Lord. It says the eye of the Lord is upon them. The eye of the Lord is upon them who obey, and the eye of the Lord is upon them who hope in his mercy. He states both conditions. This is an Old Testament song. New Testament saints should get the point. Psalm thirty-three, twenty-two: Let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us according as we hope in thee. That puts a relationship between hope and mercy. We're asking you, Lord, to put mercy upon us as we hope in you for that mercy. As we call out to you for mercy, as we put our hope in you, please answer that. Psalm thirty-eight, fifteen: For in thee, O Lord, do I hope. Thou wilt hear, O Lord my God. That produces hope. When you believe he's listening, you get hope inside. And it'll calm you down. Psalm 39, 7. Now, Lord, what wait I for? My hope is in thee. Psalm 42, 5. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for all the help of his countenance. I will yet praise him, because he will help. My flesh will rejoice in hope. I will have that which I asked for. So why should I allow my soul to be down? This right here is proof, positive, that God does not favor depression. A cast down soul. There should be no cast down souls in his kingdom. Not saying there won't be some troubled souls, praying souls, interceding souls, fighting souls, working hard to get delivered souls. But depressed, crushed under the carpet like you're underneath Satan's foot permanently? No. No, you should say to your soul, now wait a minute, soul, this don't sound right. You should say, wait a second, I'm not quite in hope, so I'm against hope, which means I need to be in hope, so I better change my hope. That puts a lot in our hands. We're so worried about obeying the law. What about obeying the Spirit? The law, do's and don'ts. 
What about the spirit that says, you better change your spiritual perspective? Is that not a law of its own? Far more important law in some ways? If you walk in the spirit, will not the deeds of the flesh just kind of off to the side? I would say the law of spirit is greater than the law of law. The laws of do's, don'ts, judgments, and obediences. Not that the other's unimportant, but greater. You see what I'm saying? Greater. So like I said at the beginning of this, there are things that are greater than other things, that overturn other things. Don't negate them, just greater. Have more impact. Do this and this, but this is what will do the job. So don't let your soul get down. Talk to your soul. This song tells me I can talk to my soul. And that's a weird thing, that God gave us a mechanism that you can have a conversation with yourself and you're your own committee. That's a weird thing. you got to admit, that's a weird thing. I don't think animals do that. I don't think animals have committees. Animal goes, hungry, food, water, go get it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like thought A becomes thought B and they're out the door. Right. Human beings, no, they get in conversations of decision that go for days. In my case, a couple of years. I'm thinking of my one I'm working on. Minor, totally insignificant issue that I've been debating for two years. You know, I mean, in a sense, on the scale of eco economic scale of things, I mean, uh, uh, not economic, but eternal. eternal things, is probably a zip. <coughs> but it might have some good benefit. That's why I've taken two years to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nothing like a little bit of humanity here. This is what we do can't decide. I don't know. I, should I this or should I that? And by the time the committee adjourns, you're dead. No. We should get to the place where we tell some members of our committee to shut up. Shut up! Quit arguing with my hope! <laughs> Quit speaking against my faith! Leave me alone! I hate to tell you this, but some members on your committee were people who weren't voted into office. They're called demons. Amen. They weren't voted into office. And don't forget that the head of the committee is not you. The head of the committee is Jesus who you brought into your heart. He sits on the committee and he has a very important vote. So, don't be disquieted. Psalm 4211. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted with me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. The health of my countenance. Yeah, it sounds like those other verses, you know. Hope to my flesh. Health of my countenance. Strength to my being. Power to my inner man. Would you like to be a superhero for God? For God? Would you like to be able to do great things? Leap tall spiritual bound buildings? Outrace fast-moving spiritual trains? You too can be whatever you want to be. You just got to stoke your inner man. You got to put some fuel in it. Psalm 71, 5. For thou art my hope, O Lord God. Thou art my trust from my youth. From my youth. I never change in this. Hope and trust. Continue on forever in hope and trust. From your youth to your death. Between here and there, never change. Psalm 78, 6. That the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children. I don't know where that came from. And I seem to recall that the verse before or after it said that they may have hope. And it means in the generations that follow even there's hope. Psalm 119, 18. My soul fainteth for thy salvation, but I hope in thy word. I hope in thy word. Whatever your word says, that's what I'm going to hope in. Psalm 119, 114. Thou art my hiding place and my shield. I hope in thy word. You find that interesting? You're my hiding place and my shield. In the New Testament, our shield is called faith. But I hope in thy word. No matter how good your spiritual armor is, you also have to have war strategies to win your fights. And you also need a place to hide. It's important when you're in war. Sometimes you have to go hide. So Christians don't hide. They come out. They should be coming out. They shouldn't be hiding. Well, let me tell you. 
when the catapults of the enemy are firing fireballs about the size of New Jersey at you, the correct response is duck. Get in a hiding place, wait, and then come back at the enemy when he's not firing and not expecting you. I'll tell you right now, sometimes the best time to do deliverance is not while you are manifesting. Sometimes the best way to get free of a personal problem is not to pray over it while you're in the heat of it. You wait a day. Let that thing just fizzle out. Just say to the devil, I'm not paying attention to you today. And then the next day you go before God because you're now in faith instead of under the influence. And you say to God, you know that thing that attacked me yesterday? Not nice. I don't know who he is, what he is, where he is, or what he, where he resides, but he's now on my battle terms. And here's what I want, because I'm now in faith. I'm not under it anymore. I want him routed. I want him ruled. I want him removed. I want him ripped out. I don't want to hear from him again. And if I do hear from him again, I want you to give me wisdom so I know how to hit him this time, head on, right away, so I don't end up under him. Advanced praying against battles of the enemy is wisdom. Jesus did it for his apostle yeah. you should do it for you yeah. it's part of your hope mechanism I can even hope for future victories based on prayers I prayed today I actually know of a couple of prayers in my life that were answered because I prayed a couple of years back for what I didn't even understand I was praying for until I came out the other end of the thing I came out of and I looked back and said oh my goodness you didn't you told it to me beforehand. No wonder you put me through three weeks of agony and prayer on that matter until there was a release. No wonder you made me go through that. I never could understand why you did that. Because when the time came, I had to survive. And he'd already laid the groundwork by using me for me. Now that's a pretty good God. I therefore can hope that the prayers I'm praying today are for things tomorrow. So wouldn't you want to pray today? Doesn't prayer sound fun? Psalm 119, 116. Uphold me accordingly, according unto thy word, that I may live, and let me not be ashamed of my hope. Well, that's a weird one. Let me not be ashamed of my hope. Okay, I'm going to translate that for you. In real terms. When you have hope, and you're walking around with hope, guess what everybody else around you wants to do? Well, that won't work. What do you believe in that for? Sounds to me like, in essence, they're shaming your hope. What happens is we then do that to ourselves, too. That committee starts rebuttaling our hope. Downplaying it. When you're ashamed of something, just using the term ashamed, you're downplaying it. You're, you're meeked. When your hope gets meeked, it eventually dies. Your job is to make sure that it doesn't get meeked. You don't want to um, end up ashamed. You don't want to end up feeling ashamed. Some people have unrealistic hopes. They're going to be ashamed because the thing they hoped for wasn't realistic. But if you're hoping in what God said He would do, then your hope will not end up ashamed. You can't be shamed for having it, and you won't be ashamed for having it because it will come to pass. That's the point I'm trying to make. It's a double-edged sword. You won't feel ashamed, and they won't be able to steal it from you because they're shaming you. And you won't be ashamed because when it comes to pass, you're going to be the one rejoicing, and they're going to be the one puzzled. Everybody who said to Abraham, uh, not Abraham, to Noah. Mm -hmm. Oh, come on, Noah. Come on. What are you building a big, fat boat for? Well, the Lord told me i got to build this boat, get these animals, and get ready for liftoff. What? You're going to lift off where? From what? The desert? The soil? It's too big. You can't even roll it to a river anywhere. Well, all I know is the Lord told me I'm supposed to build it in hope. That's what I'm going to do, build it in hope. Well, but wait a second. Noah, think about this for a moment. Okay, so you're supposed to collect the animals? Yep, got to get seven of this kind, 
four of this kind or whatever it was, two by two, but seven of this and five of three of that or whatever. Now, you can just imagine all the relatives of Noah trying to make him ashamed for that hope. Oh, come on, no. What, you're going to go catch the armadillos too? Now, just where are you going to catch that creature right there? See that creature right there? He runs at 70 miles an hour. You're going to catch him? It's going to take you at least 500 years. I mean, some of us are older than that, but it's going to take you that long just to go collect them. Yeah, yeah. You see what I'm saying? The natural man will always try to make you ashamed of your hope. But the truth of the matter is, if it's based on God's word, God's promise, or God's declaration of events to come, prophecy, true prophecy, you will never be ashamed of your hope. Some of us are suffering under the shame of hope broken because we bought some false prophecies. Some of us are ashamed because we didn't fulfill the right prophecies because we didn't obey. Some of us are ashamed because, well, you know, we just get ashamed. <laughs> No real reason we dislike shame sometimes. Just part of our nature to be embarrassed. Let your hope be in God. Let it be strong and your shame will not be there. Psalm 130, verse 7. Let Israel hope in the Lord. That was 130, verse 7. For with the Lord there is mercy. With him is plenteous redemption. Ooh, I like that. I like that. Lots of saving. I like being rescued. Oh, rescue me lots of times, Lord. Please do. Redeem me whole bunches, because i got a whole bunches to be redeemed of. Hope thou in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy. How many failings have you got in your life this week? <laughs> I don't want to count them. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to hope in mercy. Really doesn't matter. Last week I had ten failings. This week I have twenty. Yesterday I got mercy for ten. This time I got mercy for 20, right? That's hope. See, how else can you have hope if you don't have hope in these things? This is your hope. Mercy, grace, forgiveness, redemption, salvation, hope. Amen. Psalm 146.5. Here's a song to sing. Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God. Sounds like a good country song. Hope is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help. I wonder why he didn't say God of Israel for his help there. <laughs> Think about it for a second. Hath the God of Jacob for his help. Oh, yeah, that's right. This God even helps the supplanter. In the days before you became the prevailer with God, and you was really the uh, try to do it by the wrong ways, sneaky approach, that God even helped. <laughs> That's pretty funny. You were the third man on the bottom of the rung of the totem pole and nobody even noticed you, Jacob. And now you're the ruler head of a nation that's going to be forever. Yeah, that's the God I want. The one who catches me while I'm on the ground. You know, it's one thing to believe God when I'm the God of Israel, you know. We're all prevailers. We're God. Yeah, I can have some hope when I've seen a lot of spiritual life and excitement. But when I'm down here at the Jacob level and it looks like my big brother is overturning everything and, you know, I'm going to get nothing out of this deal because Dad doesn't even favor me, <clears throat> spiritually speaking, so we think. And that's the God that we want, right? The God says, okay, i got to work out this timeline for you, don't I? Yeah, you do, because right now it's a mess. Okay, Jacob, here's what we're going to do. Ah, yeah. Thank God of Jacob for his help. Psalm 147.11 The Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him, in those that hope in his mercy. So, his eyes upon him, and he's pleased. Oh, that's nice to know he's pleased. God's pleased with me. He's pleased with me because I'm hoping. Wow, that's cool. I thought he was only pleased with me if I obeyed. I thought he was only pleased with me if I did it perfectly. I thought he was only pleased with me if I was spiritual. Super spiritual. Hyper spiritual really spiritual. I thought he was only pleased with me if I prayed four hours a day. Now, let me ask you, mm. hypothetically speaking, if a person prays four hours a day in doubt, mm -hmm. and another man prays five minutes a day in hope, wouldn't it be kind of um, ironic? I prayed four hours a day and God didn't answer. Well, I'm sorry, but if you're standing before God going, I thank the Lord that I'm not like that man. 
Or if you're like the Pharisee throwing your spiritual tithe, that is your prayer as it were, your spiritual tithe into the prayer kitty, and you're dropping this big lump of gold, you know, here's my prayers, God, long and arduous. Funk. And the other little guy comes up in desperation with two mites of prayer and says, I don't know what else to pray, Lord, I'm desperate, but I trust you. Thanks. Clink. And all these guys over here go, God's never going to reach him because he doesn't have this and he doesn't have that and he didn't do this and he's not part of us. And I think Jesus is going to look down at that prayer and go, two mites gave me everything he had. Everything he had. He hoped in me 100%. And you hoped in your offering of me at 100%. <laughs> no, I think the spiritual might is as powerful as the other. He hopes. He takes pleasure in those who open his mercy. Acts 23.6. Some more hope verses. Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees. He cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I'm a Pharisee son of a Pharisee, of the hope of the resurrection of the dead, I'm called in question. In other words, these guys, they don't like the fact that I believe in the hope of a resurrection. And this is what this to-do is all about, my hope. <laughs> Can you imagine shaking up a whole nation over the word hope? Well, I promise you, wherever the devil is involved, any hope you express that is biblically based and sound will get you a stirring up all around. <laughs> They're not arguing over whether you're a good man or a bad man. They don't want to string you up in irons for that. They want to string you up on a doctrinal point of hope. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So what is your hope? What are you believing in that they're going to try and question? <laughs> what do you believe? Is it a hope? He had the hope of the resurrection of the dead. Can you imagine that? He walked around with this thing in his heart of, I'm hoping in the resurrection. They looked at him and said, oh, nee, 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 nee. <laughs> They got mad at Jesus, too, for having hope. Three days, three nights, I'm going to raise up this temple. Uh-huh. You know how you can do that? How you can do that? You honestly expect people to bow in front of your feet for your hope? Forget it. Forget it. The world is buried in darkness. You know what? You're the one that's got the virus that's contagious to darkness. Think about this. You're the one that's got the virus that's contagious to darkness. You can infuse hope into the system of darkness. Don't expect the darkness to go, cool. It's got to be invaded. But just ask yourself, what other doctrinal points do you believe in hope? And how many of them has the devil tried to steal from you? Romans 5.5 5, Hope maketh not ashamed. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. Hope maketh not ashamed. There's no shame in hoping. Say, so, but you hope for things that you never saw in this life. Do you know that someday I'm going to have hair again? I'm being a little tongue-in-cheek, but my shiny spot up here is going to go away. You know why? Because, see, it went away. This stuff up here went away because of something stress or genetic disposition which is broken through generations. I'm sorry, but Adam didn't walk around with a crown. Okay? He had a decent head of hair. I'm going to hope for a head of hair. If I don't get it in this life, you'll see me in heaven with a head of hair. <laughs> now, it might be spiritual hair. It might be, I don't know what it's made of. But I just don't think you're going to get to heaven and see Anthony as a cue ball. Period. <laughs> Down My point is, if I get there, if I get there, I will not be ashamed for hoping, even if I hope for hair. Even if it turns out that that was kind of a asking a miss, that I might consume it upon my own vanity, you know, in which case maybe I will be bald when you get to heaven, make me there. So, you know, whether you see me bald or hairy, don't worry, it was the Lord's will. I'm being a little tongue-in-cheek because I want you to catch the importance of it. You won't be ashamed for believing. Don't worry about believing too much. Don't worry about having too much hope. Worry about having too little. Because that's where the weakness is right now. Worry about not believing God for the impossible. Yeah. Hoping for the impossible. 
So maybe it's impossible I won't have a full head of hair. Well, maybe it is. There's some other things far more important than my hair. <laughs> but my hair is a spiritual type <laughs> of my hope in God. If he can give me a whole new glorified body after sowing this one in weakness, he can give me hair. <laughs> my hair never really was that important to me anyway, but you get my point. <laughs> Romans 15:4 For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we may through patient patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope through patience and comfort of the scriptures we might have hope I don't have time to read my bible I don't understand why I don't have any hope Well, I read some of those verses, and they just seemed to condemn me, so I stopped reading my Bible. Uh, try some other verses. Devil's twisting the word on you. The scriptures are supposed to produce comfort and patience and hope. Second Corinthians 3.12 Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. Because I have hope, I can speak bluntly. Bluntly, plain, straight. I can cut it straight. <coughs> See, a person who's unbelief can't cut it straight. A person who's unbelief has to mix it all up. It's got to get really complicated. A person in hope just simply says, I don't know what your problem is. What's your problem? Isn't God big enough? Isn't the universe powerful enough? Hasn't he filled me with the Holy Ghost? What's your problem? That's pretty plain. Speak plainly. Paul spoke plainly. Here's what you do. Here's how you do it. Here's why you do it. Here's what God does. Here's what man does. Here's what the devil does. He didn't have to go around and know theological 80-page novel, an 80-page, you know, size novel book like this to explain it all. He just said, here's what it is. We're the ones writing the big books trying to figure out what he said. He called it the simple gospel. We call it commentaries. <laughs> I'm trying to tell you something here. It's all about the hope anyway. Okay, so we get down into the Greek and the Hebrew and the nuances and the uh, prepositional phrases. And when we get it all said and done, I just want to know three things. Did it produce faith, love, and hope? That's the essence of all doctrine. Distill it down. Anything prophetic, what's it for? So that we'd know that we're going to get, you know, persecuted, bombed, not persecuted, not bombed, whatever. No, it's so that there's hope. When you see these things come to pass, rejoice. Because the next thing that God promised is going to happen. And there's your hope. Everything that's prophetic ties back to a hope. Because it's to the remnant. Galatians 5.5 5, For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. You know, there's a whole lot of unrighteousness going on right now. But we hope for righteousness by faith. Ephesians 1.18 The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of His calling and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. Mm, excuse me. The hope of his calling. The riches of the glory. The glory of God. Hoping for all this goodness. Don't you think you'd be happier hoping for that? Paul's prayer. I want you to have this. I want you to know, to know the hope. You've got to know it. It's based on knowledge. If you are lacking in hope, go build up your knowledge. Get the facts, man. Get the facts. See, faith, by definition, is persuasion. That's when the facts become live to you. But hope is predicated on facts, too. That's when the data starts pointing you in the right direction. Colossians 1.5 For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven... There's a whole lot of things in heaven waiting for you. 
Hang on to that hope. A lot of things down here on Earth waiting for you, too. It's not all pie in the sky. There's pie down here, too. <coughs> we get pieces of it down here called the portion of our inheritance, but we get our inheritance up there. So we get the whole pie. 1 Thessalonians 5.8 But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love. That's the Thessalonians passage, 5.8. We always quote the other one. Shield of faith, breastplate of... of uh, righteousness. Huh? Breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness. But this one, he switches the analogy and says, breastplate of faith and love. Do you know why? I realized one day why, a while back. A breastplate goes across your chest to protect your heart. The center of your life, Right? the source of your existence. Without it, you die. How many of us are living with a broken heart, wounded heart, stabbed heart, cut heart, pained heart, because we didn't have a breastplate of faith and love in front of it? And we didn't have a breastplate of righteousness in front of it. Those are the three elements together that work together for your breastplate. A message in itself a stool of its own, if you would. Because that breastplate of faith protects you from the lies and attacks on your heart. That breastplate of love protects you from the enemy in certain areas. It just bounces certain accusations off. And for a helmet, the hope of salvation, it says. It's your helmet. Yet in the other imagery, helmet is salvation itself, isn't it? See, the hope of our salvation, <coughs> as well as our currently being saved, the two together make our helmet. This is a revelation in it. It's a revelation in parallel passaging. Because you're both there and going to get there. The hope and the having together protect your mind. Think of all the thoughts that you would not be thinking if you were thinking thoughts of hope and banking on your salvation. Salvation, your rescue. That's called hoping in God for his rescue. You will be saved and you are saved. You will be rescued and you have been rescued. It's what protects your mind from certain kinds of assaults. First Peter one twenty one, Who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. There you have it. Your faith and hope might be in God. That's why he raised him up from the dead and gave him glory. You've got to see that. He died for our sins but he rose and ascended for our faith and hope. He's untouchable, unreachable. It can't be taken away. God's promise is yea and amen. It's solid. And the proof that it is solid, that God offered us, is his Son up on high, is the proof that his word is 100% solid. The devil can't take it. Man can't take it. Nobody can take it. And it isn't going away. That's what makes the difference. So you can bank on that 100%. 1 Peter 3.15 Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. You should be able to tell people why you're so happy. You should be able to tell people why you're rejoicing. Your rejoicing is in your hope. I can rejoice because God has met me, God will meet me, excuse me, does meet me, and God will meet me. And when somebody sees somebody lit up like that, they've got to ask you. They've got to know why you're so happy when they're not. But if we're all unhappy, <laughs> if we're all unhappy, nobody's going to ask us for anything. 
We think that witnessing is us going to them. But there's a certain aspect of witnessing that is them coming to us. Wanting to know why. I was drawn into this gospel by seeing exactly this in action. I saw individuals who had something I did not. And I had to know what it was they had. And when they told me, I was surprised. That's how I came closer and ended up in the gospel. Religion will not get you that. All the rules, ritual, ri rules rituals, and, and requirements won't get you that. People aren't going to look and say, I want to know what you have, because they see you with a perfect life. I've learned this. In fact, in some regards, it almost drives them away. I had a fellow one time who asked me a question. Do you do this? I said, no. Do you do that? I said, no. So do you do this? I said, no. What about this? No, I don't do that either. What about this? No, I don't do that. By the time I got done, he said, it seems too hard to me. I don't think I could ever do that. I wasn't trying to brag. I was just answering his question. And he turned away. I would have thought it would be hope to him. But he turned away. He said, I, that's just too high of a goal for me. I don't think I can reach that. But, to say to a human being, you know, I've failed a thousand million times and he always is there. Yeah. That brings instantaneous response. You know, I've failed so many times and nobody seems to love me or care or want to know. My perfection is not what brings salvation to others. My offering of hope and perfection might. My offering of hope certainly will. As things get harder and harder out in the spiritual worlds, how many churches are going to find themselves withering up because they have no hope? They had faith. They had love, social programs, and otherwise. But they had no hope. Churches die, in my opinion, because they lose hope in their leadership. And they go somewhere else that they can hope. They don't die because they disbelieve necessarily. They die because their hope gets crushed. They allow the devil to crush it, or they get crushed, or something happens and it gets crushed. And they have to go find another place because their hope is broken. But God wants to be the God of our hope. He wants to be the one that supplies our hope and our leadings. 1 John 3.3 3, Every man that hath this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. Every man that has these hopes, all of these hopes, the, the doctrinal hopes and, the, and the, just the awareness of having hope hopes, all of this hope will lead you to a place where you say, okay, I'm going to let go of this, I'm going to let go of that, in hope of this. An athlete who is hoping for the gold medal, going to run to the gold medal at the Olympics, is going to let go of a whole bunch of things in life so that he can get that gold medal. He isn't going to be sitting down at the bar with his buddies, drinking three nights out of the week. He's going to be down at the track three nights a week because his hope is in the gold medal he wants to achieve. Likewise, we will find ourselves not always doing the things that we would otherwise do because our hope is for something else. And it's hard sometimes doing that. For ourselves it's hard because we feel like we're giving up a piece of ourselves sacrificing, as it were, on the altar of our hope. And sometimes it's hard on us because when we finally get to the place where we're willing to sacrifice it on the altar of our hope for us, somebody else is going to have to pay the penalty for that sacrifice. Somebody else is going to lose something else. Because we're all intertwined and interconnected. How many people have gotten born again and lost 50% of their friendships? Because those people wouldn't come with them into it. Well, you don't understand. I, I, I'm reaching for the Savior. I've got to reach for the Savior. If you come with me, we can reach together. And they say, no, no, I don't think I want to do that. Well, I have to do this because this is where my hope is. Okay? Um, some people have lost mates, marriages, because they had a hope and the mate couldn't align to it. And they just can't. They don't have the same hope. Now that's tragic. God does not want that. He would like to work agreement and he'd like to work hope together. But I've seen people pay penalties for hope. For the drive. 
Some people say it's for ambition. And ambition is a, is a two-edged sword. There's good ambition and there's bad ambition. It took me a while to figure that out and understand that. There's ambition that sacrifices everything, slaughters everything every which way you go. And there's ambition which correctly assesses what needs to be thrown overboard without damaging. There's two kinds. One's spiritual, one's carnal. Carnal says, you got to understand, it's me, 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 and dip, 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 and it's, you know, bullets flying. And if you don't, if you don't get in line with me, 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 then that's the way it is. And it's ambition. But it's ambition fueled by a hope of something. And then there's an ambition that says, i got to have this, reach for this, that's something God wants me to reach for, and God is going to have to work everything around me for that to happen. And that's a different kind of hope. Why would God work everything around you for it? The answer is real simple. If it's something he has in his plan that he wants done, then it's his responsibility to work the entire calling. And if it doesn't align and you lose something, then it was inevitable. Because God can work all things to good, he says. So what happens if he can't work something to good? Then that something may or may not have belonged. Hard to know. But my point is, it's different than the other kind of hope. That self-centered, ambitious hope that crushes everything around it for the sake of me is not the one I'm talking about. I'm talking about the one that's for the sake of him that then puts the burden on him to help work out the details. Every man that hath his hope in him purified himself even as he is pure. Remember that your hopes are as important as your faith. That is why it is listed as one of the three things you need. We overemphasize love. We sometimes overemphasize faith. And we ignore our need for hope altogether. The bottom line of this message was obvious. Hope thou in God. The second line of this message is make sure you're in hope. And I meant that in the way the Greek word in is used. Live within the sphere of hope. Live in hope hope. Let it be your dwelling place. Out from there you can manifest your love, manifest your faith, manifest your truth, manifest your revelation, but live in hope. Help pray for anybody who feels depressed, hope broken, crushed, confused. Always work to bring them back to that place of hope. Because from that place of hope comes strength comes the ability to see the right road, to know where you're going correctly. In hope, in the promises, we have a future. That's where our next step is going. The road may twist and turn. The circumstances change. People's up and down, upheavals, you know. But a person who's in the center of God's will is going to see that which they hoped for and not be ashamed. I am not willing to give up yet on things that I'm hoping for, though the odds seem against me. And when the day comes, or if the day comes, that I'm supposed to lay down that hope for a different hope, I hope that he would tell me why. Right. If it is undoable. It's doable, but it's not doable, you know? Because the hope should someday produce if the faith is with it. Because God honors hope and faith. He watches over those two elements. And whereas we sometimes get frustrated saying, I know I've been believing, I've been believing, I've been in faith and still not. Way down inside you're going, I don't know. I'm still kind of, I don't know. Flip it around. Get the I don't know out of there. Get the I don't know out of there. And bring out the I believe. And then add the, in him. And then add the, forever until it happens. <laughs> and then add the, and I'll praise him for it when I get it. And while you're at it, praise him for him before you get it. Because before you thought to pray, before you thought to have hope, he already knew. From the foundation of the world, 
what it was he was going to do for the thing that you just thought of yesterday. And that should give you some hope. You are a finite being stuck on an eternal time scale, serving a God who sees the whole picture. And because he sees the whole picture, there's nothing missing. Your hope can be infinite even though you are finite. Your hope can be forever, eternal, impossible. Because he's the God of the impossible. Even though you live in a little teeny flesh world existence that seems like nothing's possible. <laughs> if we can accept that for each other and pray for each other on this basis, we may find our three-legged stool a little bit more stabilized. We may find ourselves a little bit more successful. We may find ourselves moving from platform to platform in life. The circumstance to circumstance, change to change, a little quicker, a little faster. Maybe the transitions will be a little bit smoother. People will look at you and go, I don't know, how, how come you weren't troubled? How come you weren't disturbed? Well, I don't know. I just, I just knew God was going to work this one out. I just knew. I, and I just trusted him for it. I, I don't know how I knew. I just knew. Well, what is that? That's hope. I just knew. The I don't know is unhope. The I know is hope. But the faith is going after God and saying, do it, do it, do it, do it. Sit on your three-legged stool and be at peace. Help me sit on my three-legged stool and be at peace. And if you see somebody tilting on a three-legged stool that seems to be, you know, one leg's too long and the other leg's too short, you know, you can either pray them a longer leg or give them an education, but don't let your natural man run the show on this one. Your spiritual man has to run the show on this one because he's the only one who can tap in correctly to understand the balance between faith, hope, and love. So, trust in God. Jesus, thank you for this message. It's been a fun message. Ask, Lord, that you would use it everywhere you can. Amen.